turbochargers are great. They increase efficiency, they add more power. <laughs> but are, in fact, they unreliable. Let's get into it now. Life's too short to drive boring cars. So I make no bones about it. I prefer turbocharged vehicles just because of the increased efficiency and more specifically, the increased performance. But not everybody's looking for that. And I wanna share with you today the benefits of running turbochargers versus the benefits of running naturally aspirated, that's without turbochargers or forced induction, how the fundamental turbocharger works. I'll give you some examples of both types of vehicles that have found success either way, and I'll be also be glad to share with you the bottom line, are they unreliable? Let's go. So which ones of these are turbochargers? Well, let's take a walk. No, this one's not turbocharged either, but the next one is. So is the next one. So is the Volkswagen. So is the van, so is the S-Class, so is the E-Class, and yes, the SUV, the BMW, and the Benz, as you can see, is V8 and it's twin turbocharged. So you're starting to get the theme here. Most vehicles today are turbocharged and transitioning into hybrid and turbocharging, and that's just the way it's gonna be. But let's walk through the basic fundamentals of how a turbocharger works. Every vehicle, right now, internal combustion engine, consumes fuel, it takes air, fuel, explosion, and then the exhaust leaves the engine. Then it typically goes down through the exhaust system and out the back. But now with the turbocharged vehicle, it leaves the engine, goes right away into a turbo, starts turning that turbo, the rest of the residual exhaust gases go out, but that exhaust gas turbine is coupled up to another turbine on a cool side that takes fresh air from the outside, and now it's turning because it's coupled and essentially regurgitates that fresher air now through an intercooler to additionally cool the temperature by, by dozens of degrees before it puts it back into the engine. So as you drive harder, the turbo spins faster, then you build boost even quicker. Of course, more exhaust goes out there, added boost means more pressure and more power. So the obvious gains from going to turbocharging was they can go with a smaller engine, less cylinders, with a turbocharger and produce actually more output than an outgoing, say, larger engine. For example, you can go with a small displacement four-cylinder turbo engine and makes more power than an outgoing V6 that was naturally aspirated before it. It would clearly make better fuel economy and as well, in, generally, in general cases, it produces a better torque band and gives you better drivability at lower RPMs. All of this while trying to save the environment and reduce the harmful emissions to the sky. That's what they say anyway. For example, we have a Ford Escape here and I'll give you the example of some engines that were available. If you went with the base four cylinder engine, it was 2.5 liter and it made about 168 horsepower. You could step up to a 1.6 liter turbo that made 173 horsepower. Or if you went to a two liter four cylinder turbo engine, EcoBoost style, it would be good for 231 horsepower, which clearly shows a turbo two liter makes far more power than a naturally aspirated two and a half liter. The two liter even makes more power than the outgoing V6. And then Porsche and the 911 Carrera realized their luck ran out. With a naturally aspirated flat six, they pushed as much thermal limit as they could get out of the flat six engine with up to 3.8 and four liter engine displacement. Then they had to go to something a little newer. And in 2016, when they introduced the, the 991 generation two is when they finally introduced a three liter twin turbo flat six for the naturally aspirated car. Yeah, that's right, it was turbo, but it wasn't the turbo car. That's because they needed to bring more power, more efficiency to the game, and they were out of steam with the naturally aspirated layout. So performance and efficiency are certainly better out of a turbocharged car, but what are some of the drawbacks on those vehicles? Well, for one, Right here we have a BMW 750i. That has the infamous 4.4 liter twin turbo V8 that's called the N63. One of the drawbacks is excessive heat under the hood. And with all of that heat under the hood, is bad enough in a standard vehicle like that, but with BMW and that V8, they actually put the two turbos in the V of the engine to reduce the distance that the exhaust has to go to the turbo to get it spooling, as well as reduce the distance from the turbo back into the intake manifold, so it drastically reduces the turbo lag and ultimately improves performance. But that unfortunately creates all that extra heat in places you don't want it. Starts melting plastics, starts 
melting valve guide seals, and now you start to look at excessive oil consumption, electric failures, hoses and plastic fittings all melting down. And then it also takes a toll on the oil, and unfortunately the oil runs the vanos, which is the variable valve timing system, which is your timing, and then you can start having issues with that, timing chain tensioners, and of course the cleanliness of the oil in general takes a bit of a hit because of all of that excessive heat running through the turbo. Remember, the turbo bearings are also lubricated by engine oil. But excessive heat is controllable in some circumstances if you design the vehicle properly. There is another drawback to having a turbocharged vehicle, and that is back here. Right there we have the exhaust tips. One and two right there. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is you don't get exhaust noise when you have a turbocharger feeding it. Because remember, as the exhaust comes out of the engine, it goes through a turbo first, which essentially replicates another muffler in line. That reduces the engine sound, and if you like your performance exhaust sounds, you're often gonna take a little bit of a compromise because of a turbocharged installation. Turbocharged vehicles also require additional maintenance. There's no skipping or extending your oil service maintenance because the oil is critically important. It gets hotter, not just because the extra heat under the engine, but the oil that goes through the turbo cartridge to lubricate gets exposed to extreme heat, as well as compressing the air and putting more air into the engine via turbocharging means that you're going to have additional heating in the engine anyway. Because like most race engines, you either run turbocharging, supercharging, or you run a high static compression ratio means you're increasing the heat. Heat through the engine, heat on the turbo, heat throughout the system in general means it's much more important to take care of your maintenance and in short order. Another couple of drawbacks with turbocharging is far more complex. You don't just have the turbo and the plumbing from the exhaust side as well, plumbing to the intake manifold. You have the intercooler. You have waste gates that control and regulate the pressure that goes into the engine. You also have the electronics associated and the tuning and the programming. It's far more complex system than you get in a naturally aspirated engine. We also can't forget the Honda. Remember when the Honda Civic went with a naturally aspirated engine? They were bulletproof and they ran forever. Then along came the 1.5 liter turbo engine engine. That proved to be a real big problem because all of a sudden they have oil dilution issues. That's right, on cold engines, when you have a little more expansion in the cylinder and direct injected, you wind up putting extra fuel past the rings and into the oil capacity. That then means that you start washing down cylinders, you start diluting the oil, and that can result in early deterioration of rod bearings and the bottom end of the engine. Now Honda's been working on that, they're getting it worked out, but it has been a real issue. Also with turbocharged cars, you have to heat them up a little bit before you get on it, and you certainly want to cool them down before you turn the car off after a hard run on the freeway or the highway. Let it cool for 30 seconds to a minute. If you're the kind of person that does short trips or you're on and off and you don't worry but you're just in and out of your car and you drive it rough, definitely a naturally aspirated engine is the way to go. Now what are some of the benefits of cars like this? What we have here is a naturally aspirated 3.5 liter V6 Honda Accord. Yes, they're great, they're ultra reliable, and what are some of the benefits? Some people are gonna immediately jump to reliability, but that's not always, in fact, the truth. However, there are some benefits, and what it means is less plumbing, less parts, and chances are less things to break and go wrong. That's a win, so it's gonna be lower overall operating costs if you own the vehicle for an extended period of time, five years, 10 years, and beyond. This is gonna cost you far less money in the long run. You're likely not gonna have to be as strict with your oil services, as you are with turbocharged vehicles, you're not building or generating the heat under the hood that you would with a turbocharged car. You're also not gonna get the turbo lag when you punch the throttle, it's gonna be immediate go. There's no turbo lag waiting for the turb to, turbo to spool like you get in the turbo vehicles, it's just gonna punch and go. It also potentially could be a lot easier for the DIYers out there. There's gonna be less equipment under the hood and probably more space to get at what you need to get at. For example, spark plugs and items like that are gonna just be a simpler vehicle to work on altogether. It's better if you're doing short trips, frequent little trips, five miles, 10 miles. Those kind of trips are hard on turbo cars. They're kind of hard on diesel vehicles as well. But naturally aspirated gas jobbies like we see right here, no sweat, just let it rip. Are turbocharged vehicles really that unreliable? Well, generally, not necessarily. Again, if you design the car appropriately and if the manufacturer is legitimate, for example, Porsche, they know how to build a turbo engine, lower compression ratio, up the oil cooling management, design a sturdier top end, and overall improved cooling means you can have a very, very reliable turbocharged engine. And you can, on the other side, have a Chevy Cruze where it's poorly designed, poorly constructed, and it can be very unreliable on its own right. But generally, as a rule, if you're talking apples to apples, Ford Focuses, Ford Escapes, 
Explorers. We also talk about the Hondas naturally aspirated versus the Turbo 1.5. And the BMW is a great conversation because the older naturally aspirated engines are easily more reliable than any of the late model turbocharged counterparts. And with all of that said, be sure to check out those two amazing videos. Hope to see each and every one of you real soon. Catch you then. Bye-bye.